you chose to go with the man who killed your parents. We're trying to find out why. And then each day he got more demented. And he once told me that he had an evil side that was taking over and that he was going to fall into it. And that he was scared. My mother and my father have just been killed. What makes you think that they have been killed? Now? There is blood everywhere. He felt he was trapped on this earth. This is his hell. Five fugitives are arrested just three days after the murders. The allure of the vampiric living can involve a compensation in sorts of perhaps people, people's past, individual hurts. It is a way not so much to mend the scars as to cover them for some. In 1995, Fox aired a show called Kindred, The Embraced. It had eight episodes and only lasted a year. But that was long enough to create die-hard fans. Fans who would take to the internet to debate their vampiric fantasies. This was the start of Vampire Mania. It soon was sweeping the country and luring in the young and vulnerable. Murray, Kentucky, was a college town known for being in the center of America's Bible Belt. Teenage vampires would gather together to play the tabletop role-playing game, Vampire the Masquerade. Draped in black cloaks, heavily dyed hair, donning fake fangs, some taking the game more seriously than others. Jaden, also known by his mortal name, Jeremy Murphy, was the leader of the Murray Vampire Coven, taking upon his fledglings by offering his blood and feasting upon theirs to strengthen their bonds. Some said Jaden, the prince of the city, could levitate. When not playing their game, the coven would shade themselves in the corner of the local Hardee's. A quiet but mysterious boy had recently moved back into town, Roderick Farrell, or Visago as he called himself. Rumors of his ability to deeply connect with the darker world, and of course, his awakening from his 500-year slumber and rebirth as a 15-year-old boy, cursed with mortality, sparked Jaden's interest. When Rod showed up at school, he was, you know, he attracted me because of the fact that uh, he uh, wore black like I did, you know, and he didn't want to fit in with a clique or any of that shit. It was just like, uh, <clears throat> he didn't care. He didn't care what people thought about him, which attracted me to him. Jaden approached Rod in the school hallway expecting a fight, but the two boys found out they had a lot in common. Quickly, they became close friends, bonding over their vampiric lifestyle and beliefs. Rod spoke about how he was sent back to Earth to challenge God, and how his prophecy would be revealed by the year 2000. His eternal torment would finally come to an end, and he needed a vampire family right there in Kentucky. By January of 1996, Rod was officially brought into the coven in a crossover ritual, which involved sharing blood and sitting in quiet meditation. Over time, their differences became clearer. Jaden had more respect for life and identified as a Christian, whereas Rod was more in tune with his darker side and wanted to guide others. His apparent disdain for human life made Jaden uneasy. But it was just talk, right? With the arrival of this new vampire, supernatural occurrences were coming to light. Witch covens became more prominent in the graveyards. Animals were found hanging from trees, and markings along the highways. Jaden knew Rod had something to do with this, and truly started believing he could be as powerful as he claimed. Jaden decided to invite his new friend to play Vampire the Masquerade their go-to tabletop RPG at Murray State University with the Improv Club, much to Rod's amusement. The over-the-top theatrics of these wannabe vampires who didn't even engage in bloodletting was laughable at first. 
but soon Rod became enamored in the universe. Slowly, he became out of touch with reality, starting to use narcotics and creating a vampire following of his own. With Rod starting to display more erratic and violent tendencies, Jaden started distancing himself. According to Jaden, what made him officially step away was one day at the graveyard. A cat came by, and he and Rod began petting it. Then, suddenly, Rod had pushed the cat against a tree, taking its life. Jaden couldn't believe anyone could do such a thing. Unbeknownst to him, Rod's past shaped much of his present. Roderick Farrell was born on March 28, 1980, to 17-year-old Sandra Gibson. The single mom was moving from state to state, in and out of relationships. Sandra gave marriage a chance, but soon ended up in a divorce. She tried to rely on her parents and went on and off welfare. Unable to hold a job for more than a few weeks, the only option she had left was to sell her body to keep her and Rod afloat. In many interviews, Rod described his relationship with his mother like two best friends. The two would bond over vampire movies, books, and video games. Board games like Dungeons and & Dragons and Vampire the Masquerade. Sandra's reasoning for the tabletop gaming was described in true crime author Sandra London's True Vampires. It's hard enough to find something you can do with your kids today, and the game was fun. It was a thrill, sure, but it was still role-playing. People pretend to do stuff, but didn't really do it. Having grown up in a conservative household, where makeup and movies were not allowed, and a strict dress code was implemented, Sandra didn't see any problem with how her son dressed. Rod had never been a particularly good student either. He often skipped classes to consume illicit substances and eventually was expelled from school. Sandra didn't think much of it since she assumed he would get his GED and work. By 1996, Rod's narcotic dependency became too much and he began taking out his anger on Sandra. By the summer, she had filed a beyond parental control report, but the two never showed up for the hearing. Rod would often leave home without Sandra's knowledge of where or who he was with. With frequent calls to police, Rod did sign an agreement to work with a mental health worker, but he failed to show up to his appointments. Sandra also had her fair share of run-ins with the law. She was absolutely enamored with Jaden's juvenile brother, Jamie and had kissed him against his will in the summer of 1996. In May of that year, she mailed a letter to the boy, explaining explicit acts she wished to do with him, while acknowledging how young he was. Sandra had also built a pictorial shrine in his honor. Another letter in June referenced Sandra becoming his vampire bride. I long to be near you for your embrace. Yes, Jamie, to become a vampire a part of the family, immortal and truly yours forever. On November 12th, Sandra was charged with soliciting rape and sodomy and risked jail time. This deeply angered Rod, who allegedly told Jaden that he wanted to end his mother's life. Jaden believed this was Rod's final straw and exiled him. Exiled from his peers, Rod decided to create his own vampire coven recruiting girlfriend Charity Kesey, her friend 19-year-old Dana Cooper, and childhood friend Scott Anderson. He also recruited ex-girlfriend Janine LeClaire and her best friend Heather Wendorf, who he was friends with back in Florida. Rod had been exchanging letters with the girls and calling them over state lines, racking up phone bills. Quickly, Rod was becoming more erratic his narcotics use increased, and he continued to take out his anger on Sandra. The police were called during several instances of him holding a knife or using threatening language. He would allegedly talk about blowing up the cemetery with Molotov cocktails or slaughtering animals, but police never had sufficient evidence to take action. That didn't mean that Rod wasn't a prime suspect in animal abuse cases. A case was opened which involved someone breaking in at the Callaway County Humane Society. Darla Jackson, a worker at the shelter, arrived to work on October 14th to find 30 to 40 dogs running up the driveway. Darla assumed someone had broken in and let the dogs out, but something was still not right. 
Walking up to the fence, she noticed it was still locked, but someone had cut a section off and rolled it up. It appeared that several people had gone inside. Freaked out, she called the sheriff's department immediately. Deputy Max Parrish responded to the call, finding that puppies were disfigured. Started asking questions to people in the area. Uh, we got statements from several people who indicated it was a so-called vampire group that did it. The horrific act was allegedly used for a ritual, and Rod's former friend, Matt Goodman, claimed to have overheard Rod bragging about the sacrifices. Much to Sheriff Scott's dismay, the troublesome teenager, Rod, who was sitting in his office, decked in white theater makeup and painted red lips, ended up walking free due to lack of evidence. Annoyed with both the situation with his mother and the police placing blame on him, Rod decided he would relocate his coven for good. Their destination was New Orleans. What would transpire over the next couple of days would shake the small town of Murray. Sandra's motherly intuition told her that Rod and Scott were planning something. Suspicious, she called up Scott's father, Mr. Anderson, and told him that they needed to separate the two boys. Her reasoning was that they both racked up $2,000 in phone bills through collect calls from Florida. Sandra had cancelled her phone, not wanting her son wasting money on calling girls, and advised Mr. Anderson to ground his son, but he didn't have any control over his son either. The two boys had been communicating with Heather and Janine via phone and letters. They had promised that one day they'd take the girls all around the world, and Rod would bring them to see his castle in Wales. The girls would often call each other and joke about whatever Rod said, but something deep inside Heather began to slowly believe the enigmatic vampire might be onto something. She saw a sensitive soul behind all the eyeliner and trench coats. She began to emulate his style, wearing dark gothic clothes and becoming more involved in the occult. Her parents didn't see anything wrong with their daughter's change in dress at first. She often experimented with different hair colors and expressed her art. But Heather had her own share of teenage angst. She and her mother, Ruth, would often get into arguments over the expensive collect calls, and Heather would be assigned yard work to pay for the calls. Janine, on the other hand, was banned from communicating with Rod altogether. Her parents had found the letters Rod had sent, and got rid of anything that remotely had to do with vampires, witches, or the occult. Unbeknownst to the parents, there was something twisted behind the eyeliner and teenage rebellion. The coven arrived in Eustis, Florida, to pick up Heather on November 25, 1996. Rod met Heather at her high school. Today was the day she would finally join the dark world for real. Skipping AP art class, she went to the birthplace, Greenwood Cemetery, to meet her fate. Engaging in a bloodletting ceremony with Rod, she was no longer Heather, but Zoe. But something about what Rod had asked Heather disturbed her deep to the core. He asked if she wanted her parents dead or alive. Heather begged the boy to spare her parents. Anytime she had talked about wanting them dead was a joke, just being an angsty teenager. In her heart, she knew this conversation wasn't over. Before leaving that night to meet the rest of the coven, Heather left a note for her family. Dear Mom, Dad, and Jenny, I don't have much time, but I must say that I love you all so very much. I'm leaving for good, but I don't want you to worry about me, because I will be fine. I had to go with Janine because she needs someone to look after her. Please don't try to find us. Just know that I'll miss you and will always love you. Heather Heather met up with the coven at the end of the road, not wanting them to know where she lived, and got into Scott's Buick. Rod told her that Scott's car was breaking down, so they needed another car. She reluctantly told him where her parents kept the keys. The vampires separated into two groups. The boys would grab the keys, the girls would go pick up Janine. Once the girls left, Rod explained the plan to Scott. They were going to steal the keys to the Wendorf family's Ford Explorer, but they were also going to take their lives. Approaching the Wendorf's residence, Scott began to space out. I was scared, but I was also excited because I was doing something definitely outside my norm. Sneaking through the garage, the teens began to look around for a tool. Rod had brought a wooden stick with him, but it wouldn't do the job. 
Looking around the garage, he spotted an axe. No, it had already been done before. Then a chainsaw. No, too loud. Then a crowbar. Perfect. Rod entered the room Heather said the keys would be in, but couldn't find them. Frustrated, Rod turned to Rick, who was sound asleep on the couch. Rick received 20 blows. A scream made the teen turn around. Ruth, fresh from the shower, in a bathrobe, was standing right there. Rod felt a scalding splash. Realizing she had thrown her hot coffee at him, Rod became deeply angered. Scott was supposed to take care of her, but proved ineffective. So Rod had to do it, with his crowbar. A V-shaped cigarette burn was left on each of the bodies as a finishing touch. Rod felt like a god. Rod found the keys to the explorer in another bedroom. He also picked up a pearl necklace, a hunting knife, and Rick's Discover card. Heading out, Rod noticed that his green polo was soaked in blood. Meanwhile, the girls were not having any luck picking up Janine. Janine never intended to stay with the group and planned to go for the ride until they were out of Florida, then go on her own. Seeing that the plan was actually in fruition caused the teen to change her mind, however. Janine had decided she would work out the problems with her parents instead, refusing to leave with Heather. Feeling uneasy, Heather reconsidered going. Her parents would be angry that the explorer was stolen, and now her best friend backed out. When the girls got back, they noticed Scott and Rod were sitting shirtless in the Wendorf's car. Charity went up to talk to them for a little while, looking uncomfortable. When Heather pressed her, Charity just told her that Rod did something unexplainable. Charity had her own reasons for wanting to leave. She was absolutely enamored with Rod and was carrying his child. The young teen dreamed of them getting married and hoped that leaving Murray would change Rod's perspective. He'd become more normal and stop joking around about being a vampire. Later that night, around 10.30 p.m., Jennifer Wendorf was horrified to find her parents dead and the car missing. 911 was called and police were immediately dispatched to the scene. The long road home finally ended here. It was Heather's older sister, Jenny, who found their parents around 11 o'clock last night when she came home from work. They were beaten and bloodied. Police believe Heather and three of her friends took the couple's truck and tried to cover their tracks. Suzanne LeClaire had come home to see her daughter, Janine, standing on the side of the road. After questioning her daughter, she found her plan to run away with Heather and Rod. Suzanne had a hunch something was wrong, so decided to call the Wendorf house to find the line had been cut. Suzanne and Janine went over to the home to find police outside, discovering the twisted crime that had been committed. Janine, as a bystander, was questioned by police, but she was in utter shock. Over 100 latent fingerprints were taken from around the house, including the footprints from heavy combat boots and a sneaker. Despite all the evidence left, there was no sign of the weapon. Upon questioning, Jeremy Huber, Heather's ex-boyfriend, revealed that Heather had run off with Rod Farrell. Janine confirmed this, adding that the teens were likely heading for Western Kentucky. Florida law enforcement quickly sent out a helicopter and a team of patrol cars in search of the stolen Ford Explorer. By the next evening, arrest warrants were sent for the five suspects, Roderick Farrell, Charity Kesey, Howard Scott Anderson, Dana Cooper, and Heather Wendorf. The two cars drove for a little while until they reached a rest stop. The boys got out and began switching out the license plates to prevent being traced. Heather still felt uneasy, unsure what had happened and worried about her parents. This was until Charity softly let her know what Rod did crushed and wanting to leave. Heather wasn't sure what to do. It didn't help that the group was stopped five times by police officers. Luckily, Rod knew what to say and the group changed their course for Baton Rouge. Eventually, the coven reached the Mississippi River where they discarded the evidence as well as their earthly possessions from their past lives. Running out of money, Charity called her mother, Jody Remington, asking for money to be wired. Jody, who worked for the local sheriff's office, 
was aware of the murders and informed her daughter of this. After money was transferred, Lake County investigators were able to trace the vampire coven to an ATM at the Howard Johnson's Hotel in Louisiana. Rod and the other teens were arrested at the Howard Johnson's Hotel on November 28th at 9.30 p.m., surrendering immediately. According to Officer Ashton Thomas Dewey, who had responded to the call, Rod had tried to initiate conversation with him, explaining he was glad to be caught and willing to tell the cops everything if he could see his pregnant girlfriend. Officer Dewey didn't have enough information about the case to discuss it, so ceased the conversation until Rod was brought in for questioning. Once in for questioning, Sergeant Ben Odom sat in the interrogation room with Rod, who was still asking to see his girlfriend. He was more than willing to confess what he had done, claiming to be sick of living, of constantly being antagonized by everyone. His reasoning for leaving Murray was because the cops were bugging him for something he wouldn't do, and he wanted to take his pregnant girlfriend, Charity, on a road trip. Relaying the events and waiving his right to an attorney, he admitted to the murder. Scott, he explained, was only an accessory and didn't know about the plan until just 10 minutes before it came to fruition. The next day, Lake County officials arrived and it was time to continue the interrogation. The tactic was to gather enough evidence from everyone to incriminate Heather, who they believed came up with the initial plan to kill her parents. First to be interrogated was Charity Kesey, known to the officers as Sarah Remington. She too wanted to see Rod and was unsure if she was in trouble. Charity explained that she was best friends with Dana and didn't know Scott all that well. She and Heather had only met a couple of days before. She wasn't too sure about the murders as she was in the car, but the group was in Louisiana because Rod was supposed to meet up with a voodoo priest. After pressing Charity for more information, she eventually admitted to remembering that Rod had talked about a deed resulting in death. However, she had assumed it was just an animal. Rod explained how they left Murray on the 22nd around 11 p.m. and drove two days to get to Eustis, Florida. After picking up Heather, he brought her to the cemetery for the ritual. When asked if he brought up the plan to kill her parents, Rod explained it wasn't mentioned that night, but briefly discussed earlier in the year. With all the information they could get out of Rod, Investigators moved to interrogate Dana, who explained that she only knew Rod for a few months and that she found him weird. Dana had verified the events, but was unsure about the details of the murders. During the event, she and Charity took Heather to see her boyfriend, Jeremy. And you heard both of them with your own ears say, we're going to kill the parents? I heard Rod say it. Scott just nodded his head and went with Rod. Me and Shay did try to convince them not to do it, but... Not to do what? Not to kill, their, to kill her parents. What was your reaction to that? They was like, well, there's no other way. It was like talking to a brick wall. Hoping to trip her up, investigators mentioned evidence obtained at the Gibson Farrell residence. A letter from Janine, smeared with blood, with a hand-drawn map of the Wendorf's residence. Attached was a wish list of countries, supposedly places Janine wanted to visit, Canada, Ireland, Egypt, Rome, Greece, and France. Investigators began to wonder why Rod would need a map of Heather's home, but the letter later revealed that the drawing was so Rod could leave his phone number at Heather's window. When the sketch was brought up to Dana, she looked confused. Investigators dropped it for the time being. Heather was next in the interrogation room, she had described Rod as seemingly normal with a few strange friends, like Matt Goodman. Heather believed that Rod was a vampire because she liked to believe in supernatural things. When asked about her relationship with her parents, she said she got along well with them, but quickly trailed off. The topic made the girl sick. After a few deep breaths, Heather was able to explain that her mom was strict, which is not unusual for a teenager to think. In regard to the road trip, Heather said everyone had participated in the ritual except her boyfriend, Jeremy, who wanted to stay home to finish school. Her reasoning for running away was a promise she had. She didn't go into more detail. I remember telling him flat out, don't even go near my parents. Why would you tell him not even to go near your parents? <laughs> because he asked me 
not too long ago if I wanted my parents dead or alive, and I said straight out I wanted them alive. Why did he have an obsession of killing your parents? I don't know. Probably because he knows if if he kills my parents, then he'll then I'd probably come to him. I I probably wouldn't have anything to stay in Florida for. Despite Heather feigning innocence, Al Gussler was adamant that she was lying. Heather agreed to a search warrant of the Ford Explorer. When asked about the plan to murder her parents, the girl claimed she wasn't aware of it. Then they asked if she had sent Rod a drawing of her home, which she denied, saying Janine might have, but she was never asked to. When asked why she didn't leave the group, Heather expressed her fear of getting in trouble. You chose to go with the man who killed your parents. We're trying to find out why. You don't know how upset I am inside. How did he keep you there? He just told me that I didn't have a choice to go or stay. Wayne Longo took over the interrogation, asking what she'd change if she could. She said, I wish I had never seen Rod in my life. I wish I had never met him. Scott was the last of the coven to be interrogated. According to him, he was just an innocent bystander and had no intention to hurt the Wendorfs. On the drive, Rod was talking about killing something, but Scott had paid no mind to it. Rod did this all the time and was likely trying to speed up the road trip. The official plan was made 20 minutes prior and he had decided to go with Rod to help. Dana and Charity were aware of the plan and didn't like the idea, but did little about it. Heather, on the other hand, didn't know and when it was revealed, she was angry at Rod for the beginning of the ride. Scott was willing to help with the investigation, despite being guilty. He had guided the crime unit up to the Mississippi River to try to locate the crowbar, but they came up with nothing. What they did find was a carving on a tree stump, a heart with the words Zoe and Fett, Heather and Jeremy's vampire names. In February of 1998, Rod Farrell pled guilty to two counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to death, officially becoming the youngest person on death row in the United States at 16. You stated it best to Baton Rouge Sergeant Ben Odom a long time ago when you said, and I paraphrase, when I killed those people, I felt a rush. I felt like I was a god. But I guess if I was a god, I wouldn't be here today, now would I? And that's just as true today as it was in Baton Rouge in the interrogation station. Dana and Charity pled guilty to lesser charges, including knowing about the plan. They received 17 and 10 years of incarceration. Scott was given life without parole as he pled guilty to being an accessory to the first degree murders. From the interrogation footage, it was decided that Heather wasn't aware of the plan to kill her parents and no significant evidence was found to suggest she had asked for it. Rod Farrell, who was initially given the death penalty, had the potential for another chance at parole in 2013. With the new laws of the US Supreme Court, anyone tried as a juvenile was not allowed life without parole as their brain hadn't finished developing. With this information, Rod was eager to share what he planned on doing with his potential freedom. Allegedly, he had a job lined up, a fiancé, and a home. His fiancé, schoolteacher Leslie Boulard, was one of his several female pen pals. To prepare for potential life on the outside, Rod took re-entry classes, obtained a wastewater treatment license, and even taught some courses. When Detective Al Gussler found out, he was horrified. He didn't give a second chance to the brutal murder of the mother and father. So, no. As far as I'm concerned, you stay there for life. Jennifer Wendorf was also horrified when the idea was even entertained. She begged Circuit Judge G. Richard Singletary to never let Roderick Farrell out of prison. May I have a place that's not traumatized by looking over my shoulder? If he ever gets out, I'll be destroyed. I'll be back to that lonely little girl nearly 23 years ago. In 2020, the court saw Rod Farrell unfit for early release. According to Circuit Judge G. Richard Singletary, 
Richard and Ruth were peacefully going about their daily lives when the defendant violated the sanctity of their home. Rather than restraining them or tying them up as he had contemplated, he entered their home and beat them to death with a crowbar. After his arrest, he described these events to law enforcement without any remorse and without any indication that he was psychologically impacted by having beaten two human beings to death. Rod Farrell was given a life sentence instead of the death penalty, as he was only 16 at the time of the crime. The reasoning for keeping him incarcerated was not only because of the severity of the crime, but Jennifer's plea for the safety of her own children. Her fear is justified not only because of the murder of her parents, but also considering the following statement from Rod Farrell made to the Baton Rouge Police Department. Thought about waiting for Heather's sister, but decided nah. Why bother? Let her come, have a mental breakdown, called the police. Which I was correct, she did. I truly believe not really anything could have changed it. I mean, um, if it wouldn't have been the Windorfs at the rate I was going, it would have been somebody, if not more people. As of 2018, Scott had been resentenced by the Lake County Administrative Judge. Don Briggs. His life sentence had been reduced to 40 years, and he was given credit for the 22 years he already served. I am definitely ready for this whole fiasco to be over with, he said in an interview with the Daily Commercial. I've talked to my brothers and they tell me, at least you'll be able to come home. As for Dana, in an HBO documentary, she described her deep regrets as soon as she was arrested. She believed she should have worked things out with her family, and wished she never had heard the word vampire, or met Rod Farrell. Dana was released after serving her sentence as of October 2011, and Charity in March 2006. Heather, despite proven innocent, faced scrutiny from her community. It was difficult to obtain a job and continue her life. A report from 2006 showed that the ex-vampire had moved out of state and was in a relationship. Heather's innocence is still a hot debate among the true crime community. Was she really a blameless bystander, unaware of Rod's true twisted intentions? All we know is that two lives were taken at the hands of a leader of a vampire community, and the devastating effects still linger in the small town of Murray. Make sure to subscribe for more twisted tales.